Good morning. It is great to see you here today. It is very good to be worshiping the Lord together. Uh, I would like to sort of impromptu welcome our newest uh, member of the church, Annabelle. Baby Annabelle was born how many weeks ago now? Three. Three weeks ago. So if you haven't met Annabelle, Brittany's new baby, please uh, say hi. So we're very, very excited to have Annabelle with us this morning. It's good to come worship the Lord on a Sunday. It may be rainy outside, but Jesus is the light of the world. So let us prepare our hearts to worship Him together. The meditation this morning is from Luke chapter 5, verses 10 through 11. Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. indulge me for a moment. Um, you know, all of life is worship, right? So it, maybe that's stretching it a bit, but we usually leave our announcements to the end. But uh, as I'll be mentioning today, uh, repetition is the mother of learning. Have you heard that before? So um, I would like just to, to put forward before you, uh, I tried to write up quite a few announcements of just what's going on. Uh, I sent it out in an email. I called it signs of life. Um, just this is the things that are happening in our church life. Um, so just to, to point out a few things for you to, to think about, to pray about, um, we'll repeat these at the end of our normal uh, announcement time, but a couple important things. Uh, Missionary Alliance Church up on Crescent Street, if you just go up silver, keep going, um, they have invited us to take part in their vacation Bible school. And so I will be playing a pretty major role in the, the teaching and uh, they need a few more volunteers. They, they have a, a pretty well-run, a very well-run program. But the, the leader, her husband has stage four cancer. So they're in a little bit of need of, of some help. So um, I have a list of volunteer needs. A lot of that is just uh, hanging out with the kids and making sure they don't run where they don't go, <laughs> don't need to go and things like that. I can't remember the official name for it. It's basically like chaperones and, and kind of the, the the shepherds. Um, we need a few of those. Um, uh, we need. There will be a, a nursery for volunteers, so we need one more person to staff that nursery for the volunteers. Um, if you're at all interested, in this, this will be the last week of uh, June. Ages six through twelve are welcome to come participate, and it should be a great time. Um, our our church here, from what I'm told, hasn't done a uh, a week long during the day vacation Bible school. It's a uh, it's 8.30 to 12.30, by the way, I think. Um, and so it, it'll be great to kind of get those juices flowing for us. They're, they're really just generous to let us come on board with their program. So I'm excited about that. Now that we've come through Easter, we can start focusing on the summer a little bit. So I, I've got quite a few other announcements here. Please avail yourself of them. I won't take more time this morning here at this moment. But uh, God is doing good things among us and around us. And we are eager to join him in it. So please be prayerful about how you can participate in some of these things. Please join me in the call to worship found in your bulletin from Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. 
For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his enemies, and under his wings you will never His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you, Jesus, that you are our shield. Thank you, Spirit, that you bring these things alive in our hearts and among us as your people. So, Father, Son, and Spirit, we come to worship you as our one true God. We remember that we on our own are nothing, but you are everything, and you call us into your family. You call us as your people as we take up this faith that you have given us. Lord, we've come to worship you here this morning, so would you please stir in our hearts affection for you? Will you please give us a glimpse or even a full view of your glory this morning as your spirit moves among us? We thank you and praise you that we are here and that you are here. Help us to know you and to love you all the more. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your insert. Well, the announcements are on one side and uh, the music is on the other side. This is a, a modern song. It's relatively simple, but I've got the, um, the melody there for you. Jesus, all for Jesus. And we will be uh, singing the first verse and then the second verse and then the chorus. And then we go back to the first verse and the chorus. Hopefully you can... I know sometimes it gets a little confusing because some of these... Modern songs aren't uh, as linear as the older songs, but it's good to, to sing together. So please stand with us and sing Jesus, all for Jesus.
them in his hands. Amen. We now have our opportunity to quiet our hearts before the Lord, and we remember the call to confession from the scriptures from Psalm 51, which says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Our God is ready and willing and able to cleanse us from all of our sin. Let us take a few moments in silence to confess to him. Thank you, God, that you are abundant in mercy and steadfast love. Lord, we don't confess so we might lay extra burden on ourselves and, and have ourselves feel worse than we might already. We unburden ourselves so we might feel lighter, so we might be made clean, we might be made new. So thank you for your assurance of forgiveness, which says, as far as the heavens are above the earth, so great is the steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion on those who fear him. Thank you that you are a good, good father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We come now to our scripture lesson, and it's from John chapter 21. Please open your scriptures as you may have them. And Michelle will be reading for us this morning, John 21, 1 through 14. We've, we've arrived at the last chapter of the Gospel of John. And this is a, a significant story as sort of the epilogue of the Gospel of John. Uh, so please, you can, it might be easier to read over here. I've given you an obstacle course over there. Uh, so John 21, 1 through 14. Good morning. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore, said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal, charcoal fire in place, with fish laid out on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come, have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. This is God's word. It is true, it is trustworthy, and it can transform our lives. So let us stand and respond in thanksgiving by singing the Gloria Patri together. The words are found in your bulletin.
please remain standing if you're able and let us sing together. We have heard the joyful sound found on hymn page 473. We have heard the joyful sound, page 473.
to stay in Philadelphia. to come to you. So we've come to you and we've brought ourselves to you and we bring these finances to you and we ask you to multiply them, to increase them, to use them for your glory, for your good, and to bless your people here in this town and around the world as you call us to participate in what you are doing. So help us, we pray, to be faithful to you as you are faithful to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. And kids, please come on up. Come on up, kiddos. Now, most of our kids happen to be at Lake Mamazine right now. So, but we are glad that you are here. Want to come up here? So we can, anyone want us to come down? We'll come down here. How about that? Come on, everybody. Let's gather around. I want to talk about fishing. Have you? Do you like going fishing? Yeah. Yeah. What What kind of fish have you caught? Do you know? Just two. Just two fish, huh? Were they little or were they big? They were big. They were big. You, know, you must be a real fisherman because no fisherman would admit that they caught a little fish. <laughs> I'm glad that you caught a big fish. Did you let it go, or did you eat it for dinner? We put it in the fridge for tomorrow, eating it for dinner. Nice. I like eating fish for dinner, too. So, so you caught that those fish to eat for dinner. Did you hear when Michelle was reading the Bible story today? Hey, Jay, have you ever caught a Do you like fishing, too? No, you don't like fishing. You more of like a hunting guy, or what? You're a karate guy, right? Can, can you, like, do karate moves on the fish? Would that work? No. <laughs> well, I like fishing. I grew up fishing. I, well, I mentioned our kids are at Lake Bombazine right now. And I grew up fishing there. And uh, we used to catch... My dad is, like, an awesome fisherman. He could catch a fish out of, like, the puddle in our driveway. He's such a good fisherman. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, so, G Jesus... His friends, his disciples, his followers were fishermen. Some of them were. And so, but you know, did you hear the story when Michelle read? Do you think Jesus' friends were good fishermen or not so good fishermen? What do you think, Jay? Not so good. Not so good. You're paying attention. I'm glad because have you noticed there's two big fishing stories in the Bible. Neither of them, the, the disciples catch anything until Jesus helps them. There are pre and it was like their job. It was their whole job. And every, all, the, all the stories we have of them doing their job, they can't do anything. They can't catch a single little tiny minnow without Jesus helping them. Well, I'm hoping, I think, they probably could catch some fish. But we don't hear about that. But what we do hear about is they tried their hardest. They tried all night long to catch a fish. How long did you try to catch the fish that you caught? Did you try to catch the fish all night long? No. No? Did it take you a long time to catch him or a little? Uh, a little. A little. Well, you must be a much better fisherman than Jesus' disciples. Because they were fishing all night long and they didn't catch one little thing. And then Jesus said, hey, there's fish over there. And he brought them all the fish that they could ever want. So, to me, Jesus is trying to show them one thing. We need him to do anything. I can't catch a fish. Well, I can't catch a fish. Well, actually, I haven't caught a fish in Bennington yet. I've lived here a year and a half, and I still haven't caught one little fish in Bennington. Huh, I know. 
Can you show me the good fishing spots? No? Oh, she's going to keep it a secret. You are a real fisherman. Well, maybe somebody will show me a good fishing spot. Because maybe I can catch a real fish on my own, but I can't do anything that will last forever on my own. I need Jesus to do anything and everything. And Jesus said, I'm making you guys fishers of people, and that is, that'll, that lasts forever. That's the most important thing in the world. So I want you to know, without Jesus, we can't do anything. But with Jesus, he gives us so much. He is such a good, good, generous Lord and Savior. So let's keep on following him, and we know that he will do wonderful things. All right. Any other thoughts or questions that you have? Open mic here. This is dangerous. <laughs> yeah. They are getting, uh, I don't know, maybe tired. They were getting tired. Yeah, they were getting tired. You're right. But Jesus came and he provided for them amazingly. All right, that's my story for you today. Let me pray and then you can go to Sunday school. Dear Father in heaven, thank you that you sent Jesus because... Uh, we can't do this life on our own. We need you. We need Jesus. So help us to uh, remember that without you, we can do nothing. But with you, we can do all things. So help uh, each of these kids here and those that aren't with us today. Will you please uh, help us to follow you? And would you please bless us more and more? In Jesus' name, amen. All right, kids. Thanks for coming up. See you later. How can we be praying? Uh, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, please open your scriptures with me and let's turn to the last chapter of the Gospel of John, John 21. And uh, as I mentioned last week, the end of John 20 is really the, the climax of the book. And John 21 is sort of the, uh, the epilogue, just kind of wrapping up a few loose ends. But there's a, there's, there's a lot we can take here for our faith and for our walk uh, today and this week and the days ahead. So it's good to look at this carefully together. So John 21, 1 through 14, Michelle read it for us earlier. I won't reread it right now, but let me pray for our time as we open the word together, and then we will begin. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for sending Jesus to show us, to love us, to carry us, to provide for us. So help us to receive what you would have us to receive uh, from your word, open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I don't know if you remember, some of you may not have been here, but a year and a half ago, I had my, uh, I guess what you'd call my interview process here at First Baptist. And the climax of that interview process is I get to help, I get to lead worship and preach. And I preached a sermon. I won't, I won't bother to ask if anybody remembers because I barely remember myself. Uh, I preached a sermon on Luke chapter 5, which is the, uh, the story of uh, Jesus calling his disciples. And it's a fishing story. It's a fishing story that's a lot like this fishing story. Even some... Uh, Gospel or biblical scholars are saying, wait a second, these stories are super similar. They must be the same story, and you know, the gospel writers are doing some shenanigans. No, Jesus repeats this story for a good reason. You know, repetition, as they say, is the mother of learning. You know, repetition, as they say, is the mother of learning. <laughs> you know, repetition, as they say, is the mother of learning. So, 
You might remember Luke chapter 5, uh, where Jesus is calling his disciples, he's in the process of calling his disciples. They uh, don't catch any fish that night. They fish that night. They, they don't catch any fish that night. Jesus said, hey, go back out and, uh, and try again. And all of a sudden they get an overwhelming load of fish. Peter falls at Jesus' feet and said, you're, you're the God of the universe. And, uh, and Jesus calls them to be fishers of men. That's when he first began his journey with them. Here we are at the end. So we've got these bookends of fishing stories. I like fishing, so that's kind of cool for me at least. And so we have another incident here. And as Michelle read it for us, uh, there's some mystery here, right? They, they go out and uh, they, they try to catch their fish. They don't. And then it's very similar. Jesus says, well, I'm going to throw the net over there. And again, they have a super abundance of fish. So uh, as I mentioned with the kids, these fishermen, as such, are terrible. <laughs> the, at least in the, the recorded scriptures that we have, we don't have them catching a single fish on their own before Jesus shows up. So on their own, they get skunked. You familiar with that term, right? If you try to go fishing, you get nothing, you get skunked. On their own, they get skunked. And likewise, on our own, we get skunked. But with Jesus, uh, I searched for a little bit for the alliteration here. With the Jesus, we get scads. That's kind of an old phrase, right? A, a scads, a, a scads is like a whole super abundance. And by the way, little fish nerd here thing, scad is a type of fish. So, <laughs> so on, on our own, we get skunked, but in Jesus, we get scads. Now, I'm going to be looking at, let's look at that closely together in a minute. I want to take a bit of a sidelight here because um, I've always wondered when, what was in Peter's mind when he says, I'm going fishing. You know, for when I was a, a kid, that was sort of my favorite little Bible verse. I'm going fishing. It's in the Bible. I'm going fishing. And uh, for a long time, I thought, wait a second. Uh, God, Jesus said, Peter, hey, I want you to be a fisher of men. You left everything. Luke says you left everything behind. And now all of a sudden, you know, now that, that uh, Jesus died, yeah, he rose again, but there's a little bit of uh, what's going on here. And uh, so is Peter basically ditching the whole fishing for men thing and saying, all right, I don't know where, like, yes, yeah, sure, Jesus appeared a couple of times, but I don't know what to do now. So uh, we're just going back fishing. We're going to go back to our old life. And uh, th that's, that can be powerful. If we take a good look and maybe... You know, we have a, there's a temptation to read into this text. Um, but at the same time, we can let, us, let this sink in a little. Um, was Peter disillusioned? Was Peter uh, disheartened of going back to his life before he met Jesus? Was, was, was his discipleship over? And, and I've thought about that in my own journey, and I know some of our own journeys here, maybe even now. It, it makes you wonder if you're in that place right now. Is Jesus still worth following? Yeah, maybe, maybe some awesome stuff happened in my life, and, but yet, I, I don't know anymore. And maybe, maybe I just need to just go back to what I used to do. Maybe I should just stop following Jesus. And, and maybe you don't think that out loud, but sometimes that temptation is, is always there. But it reminds me of a, of this, of a principle of that, that, that says, the strength of your faith is not as important as the strength of of your Savior. The, the main point of following Jesus is not the strength of your faith, although I want your faith to be as strong as possible. But the main point of following Jesus is not the strength of your faith. The main point is the strength of your Savior. If we see the strength of our Savior, then our faith will increase. But let's not look to our own faith as what saves us. We look to Jesus as who saves us. So we might think Peter is trying to ditch Jesus, but once I take a closer look at this, um, I change my mind. I change my mind. I think Peter is just hungry here, basically. And because, you know, why, why might I say that? Well, well, Jesus has saved his disciples and not let any of them go. Scriptures say that. Jesus himself said that. Jesus had given them his peace, as we saw in, in John 20, multiple times. And he's given them his mission, as we saw last week. He's given them his Holy Spirit. And he's not letting them go. And he will not let you go. 
You may be tempted to go fishing, to leave behind what has, the good that may have happened, but Jesus will never let you go. They were still fishers of people, even as they were fishers of men. Now, some of us are called to what is often called full-time ministry, right? This is my, this is my job now, right? To, to be uh, one who helps equip and serve the church. That's my job. But most of us, right, we have other callings. Painters, construction workers, mechanics, teachers, nurses, computer programmers, business owners, engineers, salespersons, stay-at-home parents, or retirees, or, or whatever. We are still fishers of people, even as we are fishers. We're still fishers of men and women and children, even as we're fishers of fish, if that happens to be your job. So when I see, that's kind of my, my aside here. I don't think Peter is trying to ditch Jesus. I think Peter is trying to fulfill his calling as a fisher of people while he walks in his calling as a fisher of fish. But what I think the main point of what we're trying to see today out of this scripture, what I think what Jesus is trying to communicate, the Holy Spirit is trying to communicate to us through his word this morning is on our own we get skunked. But with Jesus, we, we get scats. Now, we, uh, we've looked at the story already where it's just, it's, it's, I just think it's funny. I just think it's funny that these poor fishermen can't catch a fish. And here we are through, like, literally eternity. We have an eternal record of <laughs> these poor fishermen not catching a fish until Jesus shows up. But when, when Jesus shows up, they, I wonder if they had some sort of, uh, or when this happened again, if they had some sort of deja vu, right? Some lessons are so important we need to learn them twice, or three times, or four times, or I don't know about you, but I feel like I still keep learning the same lesson of, of God saying, trust me no matter what, trust me no matter what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you along, and, and I'm going to keep on teaching you. And, but it's also like, I think that the, the idea of the bookends, it reminds me of this, of this little story of you know a, a girl and a guy, they fell in love, and the... And the, the guy was super, um, super stingy, I guess you'd say, super thrifty, if you want to be nice about it. And so he thought, he just thought it was irresponsible to buy cut flowers, because that's just a waste of money. But uh, on his first date with this young lady, he bought her a dozen roses from the, you know, the fancy florist. Cost a lot of money, right? And it killed him, but he was... He, Fell in love at first sight with this gal, and so he wanted to impress her and show her his love. And despite this instinct that he had, he gave her a dozen amazing roses. And uh, she didn't know at the time that it was a big deal for him. But later, when they started dating, and like his sister told her, "Hey, I want you to know that was a big deal for him. That was huge." And as it turns out, she never saw a flower again. <laughs> during their whole dating process. And, and so she's finally real, she, you know, she more and more realized that was a big deal. So it comes that they, they get to fall in love all the more and, the, and the, he invites her for dinner and she comes in and she sees a dozen roses on the table. And she's like, and she knows in her heart, this is it, he's gonna propose because he wouldn't have done this except for some hugely important thing, right? Because he never does this. So that, that little story reminds me of, of Jesus bookending his experience with his disciples. An amazingly important miracle and also lesson for them at the beginning of his experience with them. And at the end, why would he do it twice? Because it is so vitally important for them and so for us to understand as we are following Jesus in this calling. So what happens in the story? We read the story. It's pretty simple. But he calls out to them. Hey, you got any fish? Nah. They don't even, they don't even know who he is yet. Because I, I saw a film rendition of this. And like this. it says the sun was coming up. So maybe he was between them and the sun. And he can't really see anything, right? Uh, he gives them an opportunity to trust them. They don't even know who he is yet, but he said, uh, well, throw your, throw, cast your nets over there. 
And in the other story, they complained to him. But this story, they're like, okay, maybe they think he's the local expert. They haven't been around for a couple of years, three years or so, probably. Uh, so yeah, maybe this guy's a local expert. He happens to see, a, you, know, you can sort of, sort of see some fish from the shore if, if, you, if you're looking right. And like, okay, we'll just cast the net out there. And uh, they, they listened to him, even if they didn't really recognize him. Unexpectedly, miraculously, amazingly, unmistakably, this is Jesus at work. Now, I would like for us to put ourselves in that place. Jesus is calling out, hey, you all set? You good? You, you, everything's taken care of, right? You guys are, you guys are just fine. Every, you okay? Jesus is calling out. And, and what would you say? Now, I'm not saying, don't necessarily picture yourself in the boat. Picture yourself in your life, the boat of your life. Hey, you all set? You okay? Are you going to say, like them? No. It's probably a decent answer so a lot of the time, right? Admit, when we come to Jesus, we have to admit our need. And we have to hear Jesus' voice to say, that, hey, Jesus has given us some, some clear calling. He said, you know, for them, throw, throw your nets. For us, it's, we read the scriptures and we hear the Spirit. What, what is Jesus asking you, calling you, uh, and encouraging you to do? Will you, will you trust me? Well, well, Jesus, I don't even recognize you. There's a sun in my eye. Uh, but will you, will you trust? Will you take a step of faith? And as we do, maybe, just maybe, He'll bless us far more than we can ask or imagine. Now, as I've said before, I'll say it again. What, well, here, I'll put it in the form of a question. What, uh, what book of the Bible in verse is, the, is this uh, saying? God never gives you more than you can handle. Nowhere. Nowhere! Somebody remembers. That is not in the Bible. Well, I joke, you know, I make up joke Bible references. You know, Hesitations chapter 3, verse 6. You know, no, it's... The phrase, God doesn't give you more than you can handle, is not in the Bible. It, there is a reference that says God will give you more temptation than you can handle without giving you a way out. That's fabulous. But circumstances in your life, God will give you more than you can handle so He can handle it in you and through you. Otherwise, we wouldn't need Him. God gives you more than you can handle all the time. And here's one place that He's showing that to the disciples again. 153 fish. That's more than... Th these guys, okay, I, I was sort of slamming them for being bad fishermen, but obviously there are they are true blood fishermen because here's the resurrected Jesus standing right there in the beach, kind of tapping his foot, waiting for them to come to the coals. And they're like, one, two, three. They're like sorting the fish while like God himself is standing there. Um, anyway, there's a, there's a really funny riff in, a, in one of my favorite books about that. I won't burden you with that right now, but I'll let you borrow the book. But God gives you more than you can handle because you can't handle it yourself. And uh, as I, I'm borrowing from my Luke 5 sermon a little bit here, but he's speaking the love language of the fisherman. What's the fisherman's love? What, what gets to a fisherman's heart? What makes a fisherman happy? Fish! Lots of fish! They were skunked on their own. But he is doing this again for a good reason, because as I mentioned, repetition is the mother of all learning. They needed to have this experience repeated. And this, I believe, was the basic lesson of this experience. And Jesus said it in, his, uh, in John 15 more clearly, but on our own, we can do nothing. Nothing of lasting spiritual importance. On our own, we can do nothing. And uh, one guy reminded me yesterday, um, when Marge Simpson, you know, I know one of our previous pastors was always quoting Simpsons, and I almost never do, but this one is good enough to, to, to bring out. When Mark said, hey, Homer, are we going to church? And he said, uh, why would I go to church? I already feel bad enough about myself as it is. <laughs> so when I say, on our own we can do nothing, I hope that doesn't make you feel terrible. Because the flip side of that is, with Jesus, we can do all things. On our own, they got, on their own, they got skunked. With Jesus they got an abundance. They got scans. On our own, we, can, we get skunked. Uh, 
But with Jesus, we get an abundance. And the point is driven home very subtly, but one more time here in this story. And I didn't see this until uh, one of the guys I was reading uh, pointed it out, but this, is, this, is, uh, this to me drives the point home. There is a subtle reference to another one of Jesus' most famous miracles right here in this story. A subtle reference. I didn't notice it, but in verse 13, it says, Jesus took bread and gave it to them, and also with the fish. Does anybody know any other stories you might have heard in Sunday school or whatever about Jesus distributing bread and fish? Yeah, five loaves, two fish. Feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. He repeated that one again too. The same basic idea. They couldn't do it on their own, but with Jesus, they got an abundance. The same language as feeding the 5,000 is right here. On our own, we get skunked. On my own, I get skunked. And uh, kind of in the context of, of our church life at large, and in the context of, of American Baptist churches of Vermont and New Hampshire, in the context of historic churches uh, that, of which we are one, let's, let's be honest. On our own, we as a church get skunked. Churches and their, and their leaders who have stopped following and obeying Jesus, who have quenched the Holy Spirit, who, who have ignored the Holy Spirit, who are, are not following Jesus' mission, are getting skunked. And we can see it statistically, if you like, statistics of our historic churches who have made choices to not follow Jesus' way are getting skunked more and more. But as we return to Jesus... As we remember Jesus, as we follow him all the more, who following hard after, that's one thing I just love so much about spending time with, with uh, fellow pastors and church leaders in ABC Vermont, New Hampshire, as led by Dale Edwards. Uh, we're just constantly encouraged to follow Jesus all the more for what, 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 we, what they call the mission at our doorstep. God is calling us to a wonderful and beautiful work here and it's not about running a historic institution, although we do have factors or, or, or you know, parts of our church body do resemble institution, but as a first and foremost, we are not an institution. We are the living, breathing church. We are Jesus' body. So on our own, we're going to get skunked, and we will see that decline more and more and more until God brings it back when we take hold of Jesus the resurrected, all-powerful Christ. Now, I don't want us to get skunked. I don't personally want to get skunked. I don't want any of us to have nothing. I want us, as his people, to have it all. To have everything that he wants for us here in this place. We can easily uh, uh, get, get discouraged because we live in a tough time where people, you know, we can say, well, people this, people that. But we can take our eyes off of the things of this world and put our eyes back on Jesus. There's the old song, be thou my vision. Jesus, you be my vision. <laughs> One funny thing that I have to paraphrase, I don't remember exactly what he said. One funny thing that Dale said yesterday was, I've had it up to here with vision statements. You know, like, oh, let's figure out what our, you know, what our vision is, our mission is, and our values. Uh, that comes from corporate America, by the way. It's, it can be useful. I agree, it can be useful. And, and we may actually be engaging in that type of process together. What does God want us to do? I like to phrase it as calling. What is God calling us to do? God is calling us to fix our eyes on Jesus and share his love, share the gospel in this place so lives are transformed. Our lives are transformed. And the lives of this town are to God will do it. God can do it. On our own, we'll get skunked. Now, we maybe could survive, but that's not what God wants for us. God wants us to thrive. Let's together follow him and, and trust him, listen to him, pray for him. You know, I've had on my heart lately, okay, God, what is our calling for our church? Like a specific calling. If we... 
you know, you don't, we don't want to spend our, our, our energy on all, a million different things. We want to focus on what God wants us to do as his people. Well, let's pray together, because on our own we can't do it. And let's trust him, let's follow him, let's be blessed by him, let's share him, and he'll provide far, far more than he, we can ask or imagine. Jesus is the greatest fisherman. On our own, we'll get sunk, but in, with him, we have an abundance. Let's pray. Father, thank you for sending Jesus to fish us out of the desperate situation we were in. And thank you as we follow you that you've called us to be fisher people too and to fish for men and women and children. Lord, on our own, we can't do this. You've made that clear enough. So forgive us for when we try to take up this awesome calling on our own. But thank you, Lord, that you provide all that we need. You provided your word, your spirit. You've provided your people. You have provided all that we need to have an abundance of blessings, an abundance of what you have for us. So help us to fix our eyes on you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We come now as our opportunity to take part in the Lord's Supper together. We remember that this is a remembrance. This is a sacrament. This is an, an ordinance. This is a something that we take part in regularly so we can be blessed by Jesus himself. It's, it is a solemn occasion, yes. It is also a celebration. And we are thankful for it. So will the Church Life Board members please come forward as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper together. The scriptures remind us that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We remember that his body was broken. His body was broken for me. His body was broken for you. His body was broken for all who trust in him. And that is an amazingly wonderful and deep thing. So as we receive the bread, perhaps pray and think, thank you, Lord, for being broken for me.
Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. Thank you, Lord, that your body was broken for us. Amen. In the same way, also, Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We remember that Jesus' blood was poured out for us, for all who will trust in him. And if you don't trust Jesus yet today, this honestly is not for you yet. It's for those who have received Jesus. But for those of us who have received Jesus, we remembered his life blood was poured out for us. So as we take it into ourselves, let us thank him and say, Lord, thank you for pouring your life into me. Amen. This is the cup of the new covenant of Jesus' blood. Do this as often as we drink it in remembrance of him. Take and drink. Lord, thank you that you broke your body for us. And you poured out your life blood for us. But you did not stay that way. So we remember your sacrifice and yet we celebrate your resurrection. Help us to live in the power of the resurrection today, tomorrow, and all the days that you give us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's gather around uh, in a circle as is our practice and sing uh, the first verse of Amazing Grace together.
Now may the love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit bless you all now and forever. Amen. Amen.